Hello. Good morning. I'm Michael Shabon. I'm the chairman of the board of the McDowell Colony. I'm also a McDowell Fellow, I'm very proud to say. Just like it says on the button. I, I usually, it seems to me like every year, this is my eighth medal day, I believe, and it seems that every year I stand up here and say something like, welcome on this spectacular day, or <laughs> welcome on this magnificent summer day, and I, I don't feel like I can really say those things. I'll say like, welcome on this wistful, somewhat <laughs> melancholy, yet temperate summer day. <laughs> And we're very grateful that the rain has held off as long as it has. Um, I hope it continues to do so. Um, I, I want to begin by acknowledging that we have gathered here today at the, on the traditional lands of the Abenaki people who lived in this area for at least 13,000 years before the arrival of European immigrants and all their anchor babies. You've probably read or heard about the geological mischief that one of the Hawaiian islands has lately been making for the people who live on it. Spitting fire, bleeding lava, detonations and miasmas and burning projectiles. It's awful to witness, even from a distance, and there has been heartbreak and loss, but all that mayhem, if you think about it, is only Hawaii doing what it does making more Hawaii. <laughs> the 50th state is the youngest place on Earth, the newest geologically of all human habitations, where today off the coast of the Big Island there are only a few jagged humps of hissing black stone giving off toxic vapor. A hundred or 500 or a thousand years hence, there may be an expanse of fresh green vegetation, lagoons, birds singing in the flower vines. There may be a golf course, a golden beach, a massage yurt. <laughs> there may be the shining capital city of the great Hawaiian empire or that city's slums. There may be a thousand years hence, no human presence at all, just an unmapped island born in struggle and fire a wide and fertile place, so new it doesn't even have a name. Today, we are here to celebrate a territory like that. You wondered where I was going, didn't you? <laughs> Dark, fresh, fertile ground, mad with life and its conceptions, brand new and nameless and not to be found still on many maps. We are here to award the first McDowell Medal ever given to an artist working in the discipline of... <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Do we call it comics? Comic art? Graphic storytelling? Cartooning? Cartoon art? Or is cartoon art the guy we're giving the medal to? That's it, no more dad jokes in the entire <laughs> speech. <clears throat> the questionable discipline with the disputed name of which Art Spiegelman is unquestionably and indisputably the most important living practitioner was, until he came along, unrecognized by most Americans and nearly all critics as anything even remotely close to or worthy of being seen as art. The people who practiced it were at worst, in the general view, pop hacks and pap purveyors. Sometimes they were that at best. <laughs> and not just in the eyes of critics and snobs, but in their own eyes too. I remember a story told to me by the great Marvel pencil man, Dick Ayers, when I was researching the amazing adventures of Cavalier and Clay 
how he was buying a razor or something in a drugstore in the mid-50s and overheard a mother angrily warning her son away from all that trash on the comic book rack. Hey, lady, Ayers told her, that's how I make my living. Well then, the woman snapped at him, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> and I was, <laughs> Ayers confessed to me with a rueful laugh. For most of the brief history of the blues' only rival for the title of greatest American art form, even its most hallowed practitioners, Charles M. Schultz, Walt Kelly, Will Eisner, Alex Raymond, would not have dared to imagine themselves eligible to apply for McDowell fellowships. <laughs> and if they'd had that kind of chutzpah or rated their artistry so highly, I'm far from certain that a cabin would have been found for them in these woods. And not only because of the stigma attached for so long, right up through the present moment, to art that appeals to a mass audience, that moves units, that traffics openly in pleasure, that makes its practitioner a little dough. Though McDowell has, for most of its history, been no less prey to that type of bias than any other institution whose concept of art, like yours and mine and everybody's, is still so deeply rooted in capital R romantic conflations of genius with suffering and craft with a lack of inspiration. For a century, the modernist century that laid so much emphasis on the new and the now, the 20th artists seem to have spent an awful lot of time palling around with old fashioned forms like the opera, the novel, the painting, the lyric poem, the house. Sure, some of them made films, took photographs, wrote popular songs, but the fact that sometime around the turn of the 20th century, a few oddballs working for the big New York newspaper syndicates accidentally invented an entirely new kind of visual language, arguably the most effective and powerful narrative tool ever devised, by fusing word balloon with caption and drawing, each commenting on, illustrating, and ironizing the others, and at the same time forming an indissoluble whole with them, the panel, this spectacular innovation appears almost entirely to have escaped that century's so-called geniuses. They missed the boat, and McDowell missed it right along with them. On behalf of the McDowell colony, I would like to extend our apologies <laughs> for that oversight. <laughs> Comics. We're sorry. <laughs> We're trying to make amends. Over the past couple of decades, McDowell has awarded fellowships to a still small but ever increasing number of graphic novelists, cartoon artists, or whatever the hell they call themselves. <laughs> Among them, James Sturm, uh, Cecil Castellucci, Danica Novgorodov. We have three fellows in residence right now. You can touch them, <laughs> who are working on graphic novels. And here we are today, bestowing a medal that has before now adorned the mantelpieces of Aaron Copeland, Robert Frost, and Toni Morrison on Art Spiegelman. So let the word go forth to cartoonists around the world. There is a place for you and your art at the McDowell Colony. Art Spiegelman, perfectly, is an immigrant. Born in Sweden during the course of his parents' post-war journey from Auschwitz to Rigo Park, New York, the immigrant child of immigrants and of a wandering people trailing grief and disaster. I say perfectly because for so much of our history we have despised immigrants whether voluntary or involuntary, in very much the same way and for some of the same reasons that comics have been despised. Comics, like immigrants, 
have been accused of fostering crime, low morals, and indecent behavior. They have been piled onto the bonfires of mobs calling for their destruction. They have been looked down upon, ignored, denied their due seat at the common table. And yet, like our immigrants, comics have been a secret source of strength in our culture, of innovation and discovery, and above all, of the transmission of narrative. Art Spiegelman's story is an American story, meaning it starts somewhere else, far away. And of all the things that made Spiegelman a capital G genius, maybe the most crucial is his having realized with Mouse that comics despised, denied, and ignored afforded him the most powerful way of telling that immigrant story. Immigrant minorities, voluntary or involuntary, tend to keep track of their notable firsts, like Louis Brandeis, John F. Kennedy. Among the upstart Johnny Come Lately tribe of comics artists, Spiegelman plays the Jackie Robinson role. <laughs> Mouse opened all the doors that had hitherto been closed to them, the big prizes, the trade publishers, the critical esteem, the eight-week residencies with your lunch in a picnic basket, <laughs> and your work assiduously and even compulsively fostered. As gratifying as I'm sure all that recognition must have been to Art Spiegelman, I imagine that at times there must also have been a certain bemusement in it, too. It might even have been for Spiegelman, Robinson, Brandeis, for Sally Ride, a touch infuriating. We read Mouse, we read Mouse, and we were awed by its darkness, rawness, pathos, volcanic humor, and said, as a culture, not only are you awesome, Art Spiegelman, Damned if comics can't be awesome, too. When this happened, Spiegelman, like Ride, Brandeis, or Robinson, must sometimes have thought with mingled pride and sorrow of his despised heritage, of all those before him who had toiled invisibly for so long without recognition of their glory, and thought, yeah, we've been here all along. The history of comic art in this country echoes the history of its immigrants, thus. It unfolded in the shadows in the cracks and corners, away from the bright centers of power, prestige, and fame. Today, as this august institution, which did not admit its first cartoonist until sometime in the late 1990s, I believe, acknowledges the greatness of cartoonist Art Spiegelman, I think it's our obligation to consider as well all the artists and art that McDowell has failed to see failed to foster and acknowledge before today. Not just the George Harrimans, say, or Robert Crumbs, not just the medium of comics itself. All the black artists before Polly Murray and James Baldwin in the late 50s, say, or all the potential black medalists before 2010 when Sonny Rollins stood on this podium. All the artists working outside the academies and publishing houses and galleries in prisons on the fringes who will never know the peace of a private studio or the joy of the kind of intense artistic community that McDowell affords. Everyone we've missed and keep on missing, even though sometimes they're right in front of us, even when they've been here all along. At this moment in this country and around the world, we are seeing and hearing immigrants and their stories, but as ever, we're overlooking, neglecting, and ignoring far more than we see and hear. We're missing so much and so many. We stand in the bright center of our privilege, and unless some tale of darkness and brutality overwhelms us the way Mouse overwhelmed us, we keep our eyes resolutely away from the shadows. It was just this bleak certainty of willful blindness that art was invented to circumvent and undermine. Art gives or imposes on us poor blind humans the power and with it the obligation to see what we would otherwise miss. As we honor this immigrant American artist and along with him the medium we despised and neglected for so long, let's take a moment to consider all the stories that are going untold, all the people that nobody sees, everything we are missing all around us.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.